what I was going to say is the quiz I will put up uh, probably today, slight chance it'll be tomorrow, um, will be just over, not just, two towers. So the quiz this week will be over the entire two towers because we'll finish this pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, no sheep, it's right because it's only a 55 minute class, it's not an hour and a half. Um, We'll see what happens. Uh, so we pick up on 664, 65. Um, Fermier just reveals on 663 or so, <clears throat> or on 664, that Boromir is dead. He doesn't actually come right out and say Boromir is dead until Frodo kind of picks up on what he's getting at. <coughs> Then you would grieve to learn that Boromir is dead. I would grieve indeed. And then he understands what he's saying. So, Frodo asks, how did he die? Stupid question, right? How does Faramir know how he died? Right? And Faramir says, I kind of hope you could tell me since you were his friend and such. Right? So they keep going, or they keep kind of talking a little bit. And Sam gets rather put out. Notice how, at times when Sam thinks Frodo is in danger, what does he do? Go back to the Prancing Pony with Strider in um, their lodgings, in their room. You know, Strider kind of says who he is. He doesn't give all the background kind of stuff. And Sam kind of, almost physically, if I were directing the film, I would have Sam stand up and physically get in front of Frodo. So he would be between Frodo and Aragorn, even though, you know, there's no competition and such. He does the same thing here. Top of 665. Begging your pardon, Mr. Frodo, this has gone on long enough. He's no right to talk to you. After all you've gone through, as much for his good as, you know, all these great men, blah, blah. And then he plants himself firmly in front of Faramir, hands on his hips, you know, Kind of like to make himself bigger, which is silly when you come to think of it. <clears throat> and Fairmere says, I'm skipping everything Sam says. Fairmere just says, patient, do not speak before your master, whose wit is greater than yours. Sam's name is Samwise Gamgee. Samwise literally means half wise. Kind of like, you know couple cards short of a full deck. He, he's not necessarily the brightest or wisest person. Let me qualify that. In some senses, he's not. Okay? So, um, he goes on and tells them about the dream, the boat, all that kind of stuff. Okay? Uh, they keep talking. And Frodo tells Faramir that they've gone through Lothlorien, and he's like, you know, this is amazing. You know, I can't believe 667. They show him the, you know, the, the silver leaf clasp that they use to close their cloaks and stuff. And he says, you know, so you pass through the land of Lorien, Lorien, Lindorian, it was named of all, blah, 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 blah. Bottom of 667, Faramir says, If men have dealings with the mistress of magic who dwells in the golden wood, then they may look for strange things to follow. It is perilous for mortal man to walk out of the world of this sun, and few of old came thence unchanged, out of the world of this sun. I've never, for some reason, I've literally never discussed that passage in 20 plus years of teaching this. What? What is out of the world of this sun? Well, he's saying Lothlorien is kind of timeless. As we know, when we saw that passage, we didn't talk about it, but when they were there, time kind of passed differently, right? They couldn't tell whether it was a day or months. And so he cries out and says some things. And that's when Frodo 668, I think we actually talked about this part. Frodo tells... Faramir, put aside your doubt. 
and let me do what it is I have to do. And he tells him, go back, fair mayor, valiant captain of Gondor, and defend your city while you may, and let me go where my doom takes me. Go back and defend your city while you may. What does that imply? <laughs> the sand is going through the hourglass. Defend it while you can. It won't be successful. That's what he said. You will eventually fail. And let me do what? Go where my doom takes me. How is he using that word doom? He's not using it the way Aragorn corrects Boromir's use. See, Aragorn said it's not the doom of Minas Tirith, it's the doom of choice, which means judgment. We have to judge. That's not how Frodo's using it. Frodo's using it the exact same way Boromir did. What does he mean, my doom? His fate. His death. Right? So, they keep walking and talking. In 669, Faramir says, I broke off our conversation early. Why? Because we were getting to some topics the others shouldn't hear. And Frodo says, almost the exact middle of the page. Well, let me go back. Just previous paragraph. He says, I turned rather to the matter of my brother and let be Isildur's bane. That is, I was kind of, you know, mentally feeling you out, trying to find soft spots. He said, so I, I kind of pried on my brother. Why? Because you mentioned Isildur's bane, and I thought, you shouldn't talk about that. You were not wholly frank with me told no lies, and of the truth, all I could. He said, no, 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 you don't, you spoke with skill in a hard situation. And that's when he says, Isildur's Bane, that was the point of conflict between you and Gordon, right? Do I not hit near the mark? Near, near. Not in the gold. That is, if we had a, you know, an archery target, you wouldn't be bullseye. You might be in the ring next to the bullseye. He says, okay, so I was right. Your trouble was with Boromir alone. You didn't have any problems with this Aragorn character. You didn't have any problems with Gandalf. You didn't have... Right? And he says, nah, I can't talk about that. We don't have time. Frodo talks, tells him about how Gandalf fell. And he says, Gandalf. And he gives him his real name and such. Right? Talks about, you know, conversations we he'd had with Gandalf. Bottom of 671. And notice he's whispering now. He doesn't want this to go anywhere. He says, What in truth this thing is, is Sulder's man. I cannot yet guess. But he gets, again, pretty close. It's an heirloom. It's a thing of power. It is a weapon. Okay? Alas, that ever he, Boromir, went on the errand, the errand north to Rivendell. I should have been chosen by my father and the elders, but he put himself forward as being the older and the hardier. Both true. Notice, Faramir says, he can't deny that Boromir is the eldest son, but hardier. He's got the bulk. He's got the courage, the guts, everything to make that kind of journey. And he would not be swayed. He says, but fear no more. So I'm trying to put you at rest, Frodo. <laughs> and this is really important because Peter Jackson completely skips this part. And by skipping this paragraph, you totally change Faramir's character, which is what he does in himself. I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway. That is, if I'm walking down the road 
And this thing of power, this heirloom, this weapon is just lying there on the ground. I would not even stoop to pick it up. Right? Not where Menace Tirith, falling in ruin, and I alone could save her. Comma. So, what's the so mean? Thus, with this thing, using the weapon of the Dark Lord for her good and my glory. So, I wouldn't stoop and pick this thing up if it was the only thing that could be used to save Minas Tirith for her good and for what other reason? For my glory. See, what is he suggesting there about his dead brother? He didn't want the ring just to save Minas Tirith. He wanted the ring so he could save Minas Tirith. So he would get the glory. So Tolkien starts to, well, he doesn't really start to, it's alluded to earlier, but he starts to weave in this idea of personal glory, personal fame. This is going to be really important in the next book when Aragorn has a conversation with the Lady Eowyn who wants to ride off to battle, right? He says, no, I do not wish for such triumphs. I do not wish for such triumphs. Frodo, neither did the council, nor do I. I would have nothing to do with such matters. Would there means what? See, we don't use this word in the sense that Tolkien uses it many of the times in the book. Tolkien's using it in its old English meaning, its Anglo-Saxon meaning. We simply use it as its modal auxiliary to help us with another verb. Tolkien uses it with these meanings. Desired, wished, I um, would have nothing to do with such matters. I wish to have nothing to do with such matters. Frodo's saying, I didn't want the ring. I didn't ask for the ring. Who later on, at the end of this novel, is going to say, I can't do this. I'm too small for this. In fact, what he actually says is, why is it up to me? Same question, different words, that Frodo asked at the beginning. I wish it need not have happened in my time. Gandalf says, no kidding. Duh. <laughs> so does everybody. Okay? What does Faramir say? For me, if I could have my wishes, I mean, if we're going to talk pie in the sky, you know, I would see the white tree and flower again in the courts of the kings and the silver crown return and Minas Tirith in peace. The white tree and the silver crown. The silver crown is a crown that the king wears and the white tree is symbolic that there is a king. See, there is a tree in Minas Tirith right now, in the court courtyard outside Denethor's beautiful palace. The only thing is, it's dead. <laughs> and it's been dead for several hundred years. But they leave it there. On a chance that, you know, the king might return and, you know, like Aaron's rod, it might bloom. <laughs> He says, that's what I want. What would that mean for him? As future steward, once his father dies. Yeah, he won't be king. He won't have any power. He wants the king, the real king. Okay? So, they keep talking, and he brings up uh, Gollum. Page 680, 681. So they go to the hideout, the cave, and Fairmere gives them food and drink. What have we seen about hobbits with drink? Think Pippin. Or they do take it very well. <laughs> One of two ways you can you can read that question. And they're talking about Galadriel. <clears throat> and Faramir says she must be lovely indeed. Perilously fair. 
perilously beautiful. That is, it can be dangerous to even be in her presence. Her beauty can be such that it kills. Right? It can slay. Sam, don't know about Paradise. Strikes me that folk takes their peril with them and Delorean finds it there because they brought it in. That is, there is no peril in Lorian other than what you bring. Well, who, where did we hear that? After their little uh, mind reading session, let's say, when Galadriel meets each of them and they come down afterwards and Fred or, or Sam, one of the two, says, you know, it was weird. I felt like I was naked. Okay. And Boromir says something about her being evil, and Aragorn essentially says, bite your tongue. The only evil that is in Lorien is what you bring with you, okay? And so Sam keeps on going, and he says, now, Bor, and he catches himself. He stops. But Faramir goes, yeah, what about Boromir? Now, Boromir, you would say, he took his pearl with him. And Sam's somewhat at ease. He's feeling... You know, a little bit relaxed. He's had some food. He's, you know, maybe not stuffed to the gills, but he's feeling good. Yes, sir, begging your pardon. A fine man as your brother was, if I may say so, but you've been warm on this. In, in other words, I, I knew this is where this was going. I mean, you danced around the edges, but you never really tried to get inside. I knew from the moment he saw it, he wanted the enemy's ring. And Frodo's like, Sam, it's not under in gray, you know. And they jump up, back to back, swords drawn. Three feet tall. Two and a half feet tall, maybe. And Sam says to Faramir, Now look here, sir. Don't you go taking advantage of my master because the servant's no better than a fool. You've spoken very handsome all along. Put me off my guard, talking of elves and all. But handsome is as handsome does. In other words, if you really are good on the inside that you want us to think you are, then what? Your actions will show that. So he's saying, right now, what you do right now will show us everything. What happens in the book? Oh, excuse me, in the film. Anybody? Who's seen it? Who remembers it? Let me put it that way. Faramir takes Frodo and Sam up to Osgiliath on his way to taking them to Gondor, to Minas Tirith. He's going to take them to his father so that Denethor can get the ring. Totally, totally opposite of what Tolkien's character does, right? Why? I have no idea. Because Peter Jackson thought he needed to create more conflict. Like there's not enough conflict in the 1,500 pages that we have, you know? Now's a chance to show your quality. By the way, where did Boromir really Show his quality. When he talks to the halflings. Say that again. When he talks to the halflings. I wasn't sure I heard the right preposition. When he fought for the halflings. How'd he die? We skipped it. We didn't talk about it. I mean, it might have been in the lecture I included. He died defending Mary and Pippin. What does Aragorn say? When Boromir says with his dying breath, you know, I failed. I won't go to Minas Tirith. I tried to take the reins. Aragorn says, no, you've achieved a great victory. What's the great victory? Okay, he's still alive there for a saved scene. Lives. He saved lives. No greater love hath man than that he's willing to lay down his life for his friends, Jesus says in one of the Gospels. Okay? Yes, it's true, within, you know, Tolkien's context here. How did Boromir achieve a great victory? He overcame, okay? 
that temptation. Yeah, he gave in temporarily, but what does he say when Frodo leaves? Frodo, forgive me. I don't know what came over me. The what came over him wasn't from inside. It was from outside. It was the rain trying to get, you know, back home. So, Faramir says, okay, wait, wait, let me, let me get this right. So Boromir tried to take the ring from you, and you fled, and Boromir ended up dead. And you run all the way helter-skelter, and you come down here into my lap. You deliver the ring to me. Okay? That's when they spring from their seats, back to back, swords pointed out, and Faramir sits down in front. Alas, for Boromir, it was too sore a trial. And then he says, you are less judges of men than I of happiness. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We both sell them and then perform. That, by the way, that idea is straight out of the old English poem, The Wanderer. The one that had that Ubisoft motif that I talked about, you know, when they go and they see the barrows outside Metacells and such. The Wanderer the, the speaker, one of the speakers, if there's more than one, in the poem, repeatedly says, a man of honor, a nobleman, someone who wants fame, should always think before he boasts. And what he should think is, okay, if I make this boast, am I going to be able to do it? Am I going to be able to do what, it said, what I say I will do? Look at what Faramir says. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it, I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire it, he says, that oath would bind me. In other words, my integrity is everything. Without integrity, without a personal sense of honor, I would be nothing. No, Frodo, I do not want the ring. I should take those words as a vow. I am not such a man. I am not one who desires such a thing. Or, I'm wise enough to know that there are some perils from which a man must flee. Like, leave now. You take your dirty little ring and go away. Okay? So, they capture Gollum, and Faramir tests him by looking in his eyes. Notice who else does that in the book? Gandalf looks in Pippin's eyes. After Pippin looks in the Palantir, and Pippin relates, you know, what he saw, but Gandalf looks in his eyes and says, there is no deceit there. Faramir is very much like Gandalf, which we're going to hear later on. We're going to hear a character say, this one is much, much like you. My eldest son, Jennifer, says it. Boromir was not like you. Boromir could not be, um, what's the word I want? Persuaded or swayed by you, Gandalf, and that's why you had problems with him. Right? So, journey to the crossroads. The very end of that chapter, last page. <coughs> What does Faramir learn from Gollum? Where's Gollum planning on taking them? Other than two more. Not yet he's not. He hasn't yet planned to take them to Shelob. That comes later. Very, very important scene. He's going to take them through Kirith Ungol, which is this hidden passageway Hidden, though Faramir obviously knows about it. It's hidden largely because nobody wants to go up there because there is some danger there. And because once you come out of it, it opens into what's called the Morgul Veil, vale, where you have Menace Morgul. 
what it used to be called, if I remember correctly, could be wrong here, I haven't checked out the book, Menace Ithil, correct? Yeah. Used to be Menace Ithil, Tower of the Moon. Right? So, bottom of 702. They get to the crossroads. So the crossroads, you know, Mordor's over here, and the crossroads are essentially going like this. North, south, east, west. Right? East is here, but this is Mordor. Right? What's way over here in the west? The sea. So they make their way, and they get here just about to the, these are mountains, just about to the mountain. And there's this crossroads. Okay? And they're at the crossroads part. And there's a statue. And the statue's been decapitated. The head's been knocked off. Page 702. Standing there for a moment, filled with dread, Frodo became aware that a light was shining. He saw it glowing on Sam's face beside him. Turning towards it, he saw, beyond an arch of boughs, the road to Osgiliath running almost as straight as a ribbon, stretched ribbon down, down into the west. There, far away, beyond Sad Gondor, now overwhelmed in shade, the sun was sinking, finding at last the hem of the great slow rolling. And so the sun drops beneath the cloud cover and phew, rays of light come. And the rays of light, you know, imagine that window as being this passageway. And down from miles away, this ray of light shining. And what does it do? Suddenly caught by the level beams, Frodo saw the old king's head. It was lying, rolled away by the roadside. Look, Sam, look, the king has got a crown again. Because this stone head has a vine wrapped around the forehead, and in the vine are yellow and gold flowers. The eyes were hollow, the carbon beard was broken, but about the high stern forehead, there was a corona of, sorry, silver and gold. A trailing plant, etc., etc. They cannot conquer forever, Frodo said. Who's the they? Evil? Forces of darkness? Chaos? And almost as soon as he says that, the sun dips below the horizon, and seemingly, unlike in our world, because if you go to the beach, you go to the west coast, and the sun dips below the horizon of the ocean, does it immediately turn pitch black? No. <laughs> but it does here. So they start up the stairs to Tear of Ungol. Page 711. And this is where we're going to start getting bogged down. 711. They pause. They start to think of water and food. They hear the sound, the trickling sound of water. But they're, Frodo and Sam at least, like, I'm not going to drink anything in this place. Right? And Frodo says, in response to Sam's, do you smell something? Something smells funny here. I don't like it. Frodo, I don't like anything here at all. Step or stone, breath or bone, earth, air, and water, all seem accursed. But so our path is brave. When they were getting ready to go through the dead marshes, what did Frodo say to Gollum? Anybody remember? He says, how do we shape our course? Notice what that question, what that's, question implies that this statement does not. They have free will when they're going to shape their course. That is, to shape your course means you choose which way you're going. Nobody else is directing you. Here, so our path is laid. That is, there is no other way. There's no deviating to the right or to the left. This is the only way we can Sam. Sam, look at his reply. Yes, sir, that is so, he says. Yes, that's so. And we shouldn't be here at all if we don't know more about it before we started. 
Meaning what? Where were they before they started? Go back to the first chapter. Or actually, second chapter. They're in Frodo's home, right? Number four, bag, shot, row, bag, end, because he's at the end of the road. Okay. Frodo's talking to Gandalf. What's Sam doing, supposedly? Gardening, clipping the hedges, pulling weeds. It's only when Gandalf stops hearing the sound of the clippers that he reaches out, grabs Sam, and brings him in. Why does Sam agree to go? Two reasons. Wants to see elves. And he wants to go with Mr. Frail. But he wants to see elves. Really, really. Has there ever been something that you know or believe doesn't exist that you think, man, that would be totally cool to really see? Anybody? I mean, I know something that does exist. We've all, at very least, seen them on TV. Being from California, we didn't, I'm born and raised in California, didn't have tornadoes. No, very, very, very few tornadoes in California. Earthquakes, no big deal. Been through a lot of earthquakes, okay? Always wanted to see a tornado until the Easter or the Good Friday tornado hit here. Actually, the one before hit my church. We were having evening vespers, and it, the little F0, F1, it literally went right over, tore part of the roof off, blew all the windows out of the cars, etc. And then the next week, we had the biggie. Well, that biggie, I was getting ready to go to an appointment, pulled out to the end of my street. I live at the end of a cul-de-sac, back end. And was getting ready to turn left on Highway 96. And all these cars are pulling over to the right. Now, I knew the weather was bad. There were, you know, severe thunderstorm warnings left and right. And I'm wondering, why is everybody turning to the, pulling over? And I turn and look to my right, and there, literally, less than a quarter mile away, is this massive black V. Coming right at me. Jam my car in reverse and back up 200 yards to my house, get my kids under the stairway, and I, being the damn fool I am, go out on the front porch like this, because I want to watch that sucker, okay? Until I start seeing all the debris. And then I, you know, don't need to see a tornado ever again in my life. A UFO? Yeah, I kind of like to see one of those. A dragon? A real? Yeah. If, okay? Sam wanted those experiences. But he says, we wouldn't be here if we knew this is what was going to happen. Right? Did they know this is? He knew theoretically, yeah, we have to go to Mordor. Theoretically, Mordor was what? It was theoretical. It was a bad place. It wasn't real yet for him. So, I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo. Adventures, as I used to call them. That is, before I became involved in one. I used to think that there were things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for. Because they wanted them. Because they were exciting. And life was a bit dull, a kind of a sport, as you might say. That is, they were a distraction from the mundane boredom of everyday existence. So people went out and looked for these. If we were to talk about, you know, in our world, the kind of stories he's talking about, he's probably talking about something like the old English poem Beowulf, where Beowulf goes out looking for trouble. Okay? Look at that sentence again. I used to think that there were the things the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for. That is, the heroes in the stories. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit, what Ar Aragorn talked about with legends. And how legends begin how? With real events and people. 
But that's not the way it is with the tales that really matter or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them, usually. Their paths were laid that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back. Only they didn't. Are any of you familiar, I think one of you might be, with the name Todd Beamer? All knows. He was one of the four men who instigated on 9-11 the taking down of Flight 93. The flight that went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 32 years old, software salesman. Two kids. Wife was pregnant with their third. They had just gotten back the day before, Sunday, from Italy, from a vacation at the day. That morning, when he got on that flight, he was flying to San Francisco for a business meeting. He was flying back later that day. That's a long trip for a two-hour business meeting. You know, four or five hours from New York to San Francisco and back. <clears throat> when they became aware that something was going on because the plane suddenly turned in the middle of Pennsylvania, People started making calls, and the word got out, two planes in the World Trade Center, one in the Pentagon. They knew this was the next one, and it was about the same time when the terrorists said, we have a bomb on board, blah, 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 okay? Beamer and these other guys came up with this plan, we're going to rush the cockpit, and we're going to take control of this plane. None of them were pilots, and they were all in their 30s. They were all former jocks, former athletes, okay? Well, Beaver is one of them that we have a full transcript of his telephone call. He tried to reach his wife, but he couldn't. Instead, he got a call center operator. She stayed on the phone with him for the entire 13 minutes, from when he called to when they rushed the cockpit. Okay? And tells everything that's going on. Look at what Sam says again. Folks seem to have been just landed in them, usually. Todd Beamer had no idea that morning that he was going to die. Right? He had no idea that there was going to be this massive plot. Right? He just found himself there. And then Sam says, their paths were laid that way. But I expect they had lots of chances, like us, of turning back. Only they didn't. In the context of what I'm talking about with Todd Beamer, what's the turning back? What could they have decided not to do? What was the target of that plan? It's generally thought there were, there were one of two places. The White House or the Capitol building. Just read an article the other day about someone who had gone up at 757 from, from New York and retraced the route that that flight took. Because they're trying to figure out what the target was. And once you fly into DC on the flight path they were on, you know, you have kind of a natural runway in the middle of DC. And it points to one thing. The, the, the natural runway, so to speak, is the National Mall. It's a mile long, and it's a couple hundred yards wide. And once you get that thing in your sights, you know, it's easy to hit what's at the end. The Capitol Building. The White House can hardly be spotted from the air when you're going 550 miles an hour, which is what that plane was doing when it entered D.C. airspace. And the guy flying it, the terrorist flying it, was only qualified to fly a single-engine plane, like a Cessna. So the other pilots, they'd all train for jumbo jets here in the United States. Okay? The guy flying that one, he didn't have the, the ability to pick out the White House. So 
They could have stopped. That is, they could have not done anything. What would have been the result? Think of the damage. All, almost all of you are too young to remember. Right? But if you think of the damage of the Twin Towers going down, and the damage, that is nothing, symbolically, compared to the destruction of the Capitol building. I mean, it would have been huge. But Sam says, they had the opportunity of turning back, but they didn't. The people in the stories didn't turn back. And if they had turned back, we shouldn't know. There's a thing I read over the weekend, since it was the 20th anniversary, talked about, I read somewhere, that there's a statue of Todd Beamer. I think it may be in his hometown. Because of what he did. Because he and others stopped what was going to happen. Sam says, if these people had turned back, we would never know their name. We wouldn't know anything about them. But because they didn't, we do know about them. We hear about those as just went on. And not all to a good end, mind you. And then he's going to explain what he means by a good end. You know, um, not all to a good end, mind you. At least not to what folk inside a story and not outside it call a good end. He told the call center operator, be sure to tell my wife I love her. He said the Lord's Prayer. He recited the 23rd Psalm. His last words that she heard, let's roll. And that's when they rushed the other terrorists. Okay? Those inside the story, not a good end, we would say. He, he's not still living. He's not still breathing. He didn't get to enjoy the birth of his daughter four months later. But outside, that's a different matter, Sam said. You know, this is how Sam defines a good ending. You know, coming home, finding things all right, not quite the same. And we could turn to the last page, right here. In fact, I'll give it away. We get to the very last page, and Sam returns home. And there's his wife, door open, standing at the threshold with his daughter, and she welcomes him in and sits him down in a big easy chair. And he says, I'm home. Sam gets the quintessential happy ending. Frodo doesn't. Okay. A lot of others don't. Sorry, don't need to give it away. So he said, you know, like old Mr. Bilbo. He's talking about the Hobbit. How's the Hobbit in, for those of you who read? Bilbo comes home. But home isn't quite the same, well, for one reason, because his cousins have taken over his house and they're having a yard sale because they think he's dead. He's been gone for a year. But those aren't always those happy ending on the for the characters on the inside. He says those aren't always the best tales to hear though they may be the best tales to get landed in. Why aren't they always the best tales to hear? Because Sam is kind of getting at some of the ideas Tolkien talked about in that fairy story episode, where he says, fairy stories can have on callous youth. They can have an effect. They can deepen their awareness. They can give them, you know, an appreciation for certain things. They might even awaken to them, you know, that there's this thing called a good death. A good death. We kind of think all death is bad. No, it's not. Boromir had a good death. He died well. I'm going to suggest when we get to the Harry Potter novels, all seven Harry Potter novels are about one idea. How to die well. 
You can die poorly. You see people die poorly, or you can die well. And we see people who die well in the course of those novels. Harry's parents, for example, they died well. They could have died better, but they died well, right? So, that's when Sam wonders, I wonder what sort of tale we would have. Notice what Sam is telling us. He comes to this realization, his life, these events that they're experiencing, are all part of a larger tale. Frodo, I wonder, but I don't know. Right? Huge difference between wondering, questioning, and knowing. Does any of us know the kind of tale we're in? Did Todd Beamer that Monday morning? No, he didn't. No, he absolutely did not. Did those terrorists taking control of the planes? Absolutely. They knew exactly what they were doing. They thought, in their minds, oh, this is a great tale. It's a glorious tale to die for Allah, etc. And that's the way of a real tale, Frodo said. And he just equated fairy tales, legends, with reality, with real life. All right? Take anyone that you're fond of. You may know or guess what kind of a tale it is. Happy ending or sad ending. But the people in it don't know. And you don't want them to. Why not? Why wouldn't we want a Todd Beamer to be told that morning before he drives to the airport, your plane is going to be hijacked? What might he do? What might anyone do if they were told, tomorrow you're going to die this way? They would do exactly what Oedipus attempts to do. If you're familiar with the play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, 5th century, 6th, 6th century, B.C., Greece. Sophocles, uh, so Oedipus, as a man, as a young man, receives a prophecy. The prophecy is, you are destined to kill your father and sleep with your mother, and bring forth children. So your children will be your children and cousins. Just weird, okay? And he's like, hell no, not going to happen. So you're told that's going to happen. What do you immediately do if you love your father and mother, and you're still living with them? Run away as far and as fast as you can. But, Part of the nature of tragedy is people make decisions based upon incomplete information. And the information Oedipus does not have is that the people that he believes are his parents are his adopted parents. And he runs away from them, and he runs to a crossroads, and there's a guy in a wagon who won't get off the crossroads, who won't move over. And Oedipus, who is awful full of himself, kills the guy. And all of his servants but one. And then he makes his way to a city, and it just turns out to be the city where that guy had been king. And Oedipus solves the riddle of the Sphinx. And part of the you know awards he gets for solving the riddle of the Sphinx is he gets the queen of the now dead king, who turns out to be his mother. And it takes the entire play for Oedipus to go, damn. What's the point that Sophocles wants to get across? You can't avoid it. If this is how your path is laid, say la vie, that's life. You deal with it. You roll with the punches. Okay? So Frodo says, you don't want them to know how the tale's going to end. 
Because if they do, it's not going to end that way. <laughs> So, Sam says, no, sir, no, sir, of course not. Baron now, where did we hear that name before? When Aragorn sings the song of Luthien Tenubial back on Weathertop in the first book, the literal first book, book one of the first volume, he says, he didn't think he'd get that somewhere else from the Iron Crown, but he did it. That was a worse place than we're in now, but that's a long tale. And it goes on past the happiness, into grief, and beyond. What's the happiness? He gets the silver. The grief? He dies. He goes off to the land of Valinor. The gods send him back. They kind of reincarnate him, or they, they resurrect him, so he can live for a little while with Luthien and Tenubio and have children so that we can have this novel. And the silver gets passed on to his son, or grandson, can't remember which, a Mill, who takes the Silmaril, and the gods raise him up to the sky, and he becomes a star. And what does Sam suddenly realize? We're in the same story. Because the star glass that you have around your neck, Mr. Frodo, is what? It's the light from the Silmaril. The Silmaril got its light from the two trees of Valinor. That no longer exists. You gotta read the Silver really to find all this out. All this stuff Sam is alluding to, nobody has a clue what he's talking about when this book is first published. They don't find out until 1977 when the Silver really is published. Okay? And Sam says, Don't the old tales never end? Frodo, no, they never end as tales. People's parts just go in and out. Our part will end later, dash, or sooner. Why doesn't he end or later, period? Okay, why else? I mean, I think you're right. Okay, he's not actively seeking death. That would be a suicide mission. Suicide mission would have been gone, going up to the black doors, black gates. Hello, oh, my name's Frodo. I'm the halfling of the rhyme. Uh, I've got Isildur's Bane. Can you show me how to get to? That would be suicide. And totally stupid. Okay? But how much hope does Frodo have at this point? 1%. I mean, it's getting darker every day. Oh, come on. So, they continue talking, and Sam brings up Gollum. I wonder what Gollum is in this tale. I wonder what Gollum thinks of himself. Is he the hero or is he the villain? 713. Why, even Gollum might be good in a tale better than he is to have around you anyway. All right? And I think I can do this in, in Ireland. In two minutes. That's when they realize Gollum is gone. Several hours later, they wake up, or excuse me, they're asleep, and Gollum, I don't have time for that. we got to pick up on 714. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, so the quiz will go ahead and be over, because there's only one more chapter after this. Um, the quiz will go ahead and be over all of two towers. We'll pick up on 714. Today's Wednesday? On um, Friday. And... We'll do the choices of Master Samurai pretty quick because it doesn't take long. And we'll get as far into Return of the King as we can. Which will probably be a chapter at this point.